Hi, uh, in this module on uh, strategies and materials for surface repair, we will have three lectures and the first one is on root cause analysis and uh, various repair uh, strategies and then the second lecture will be on selection of repair materials and then the third will be on compat compatibility of repair materials with the uh, substrate. So, first let me show you uh, how unsuccessful a repair can be if uh, the root cause is not really uh, well addressed. Uh, this is a picture showing a leakage, you can see the rust stains coming through the repair, uh, coming through the repair uh, on the, so as you see here, this, this is the repaired repair motor, but unfortunately very within very short period of time you have significant rust stains that means the repair is not really functioning or is not durable. So, why probably the cause was not very uh, well addressed and probably the surface preparation was not done adequately and also the bond between old and new materials was not, uh, was not adequate because of which further entry of uh, deleterious elements uh, could have happened through the interface between the old and new uh, repair and the substrate. And also for some reason the corrosion continued to happen and then uh, the end result is that uh, the repair was really uh, not successful. So, main thing in this whole lecture I will be focusing on is looking at the root cause. Uh, we have to really find what led to the failure of the in the first place and then try to avoid that uh, uh, you know source of uh, the problem and then based on this root cause we have to design the durable repair system. Uh, so, root cause analysis is very very uh, important. Now, one more term I am going to introduce here is near surface. This is to emphasize that this in this entire lecture the surface means not the very uh, you know surface of the concrete surface, but the cover region. So, I am going to call it near surface repair. It is a very complex task because most often you will be using some special concrete materials which will have different chemicals and uh, you know the uh, robustness of the mix is an important thing. So, precise material design. Uh, is most often required and then uh, you will all uh, because repair means the exposure was uh, somewhat aggressive and that is why in the first place the structure uh, you know uh, started showing uh, degradation. So, those elements might still be existing. So, you have to consider that also aggressive environments and uh, atmospheric pollution and de-icing salts or anti-icing salt. Um, you know, I mean, de-icing salt and anti-icing salt are you know very relevant for the places where it's very cold climate. Uh, but uh, you know, in, uh, also you can think of other sources of salts like marine exposure or coastal conditions, or even uh, you know chloride contaminated uh, soil or ground. Um, you know, now placement techniques and tools are critical because some of the repair materials. Uh, you know, you are not mostly talking about large quantity of the materials, but very small quantities, uh, but the way in which it is placed is very, very important and uh, adequate and you know, uh, specially designed tools are sometimes uh, very, very critical to complete the work on time with less uh, efforts. Uh, etc. and to ensure that the work is done in a quality manner. Now, durable material du repair technology, this durability of the repair is also very, very uh, important because you do not want to keep on going back again and again to the structure and keep on doing the repair at the same location. So, du durability of the uh, repair itself is something which is very important to be uh, considered and less redundancy again that depends on how much money is available and how important the structure is and how important that particular uh, repair is to the structure. Uh, if it is a you know let us say if you have a very important structure it will be very difficult to get permission or access to do the repair. 
So when you get a chance you do a good job and make multiple uh, systems to function together that means uh, redundancy. So if the, it is a not a very important structure then maybe you can reduce the number of redundancies uh, but if it is a very important structure then you have to really go for uh, you know multiple systems so that if one system fails at least the other systems take care of the structure and ensure that the repair is durable enough. Now success of a step depends on the success of the other. So when you talk about redundant systems there may be also cases where one step uh, like for example in this uh, you know uh, to explain this what it means one step depends on the other. Let us say you are talking about providing a repair material and if the surface cleaning is not which is the first step to do is not well done then the next step which is the placement of the material and ensuring a good bond will not happen. So every step in the process of repair is should be given adequate importance and uh, because each step has its own uh, role. Now, what are the different types of repair we talk about? Mostly uh, it is either for cosmetic purpose or for uh, structural uh, purpose. So when you are talking about protection or just appearance like a surface coatings or something it might have some durability uh, related issues also. Uh, but uh, people look at uh, sometimes uh, just appearance uh, so we can call it as cosmetic purpose if you are just painting for example. even painting is the first word which comes uh, to my, my to mind when we say maintenance uh, but there is lot more than uh, that when you talk about maintenance. So anyway appearance is very very uh, important and then the load carrying uh, load carrying uh, features or the structural uh, repair if you are talking you have to consider live load then barrier or unwanted environments and then aesthetics wear resistant impact load dead load all these are different things which need to be uh, considered while uh, thinking about structural uh, repair and you will see both cosmetic and structural repairs in many places and sometimes both have to be also considered it not only cosmetic features or not only structural features because even if the structure is very good you want the structure to look good to uh, look good. So uh, cosmetics is also very very uh, important to consider. And at the same time in the reverse way you should not worry only about cosmetics because then the functionality is the main thing and that should also be uh, you know considered and given equal importance. So both are important. Now general procedure for surface repair how do we uh, you know you know split the whole action into uh, various steps. The first thing is understand the root cause or get to the root of the problem and then see whether that problem is a major problem or a minor problem and then determine the uh, repair method or what is a suitable method for that particular exposure condition and for that particular structural loading and uh, you know for that particular problem. So there because you will have lot of options when you talk about repair. So you have to really see what is the best uh, and uh, best in terms of functionality and in terms of durability, feasibility, economics all that have to be looked at and then decide on a suitable repair method. Then once you decide what to do then the next step is to prepare the surface of the concrete or to prepare the existing concrete for the repair work and then apply the repair work and then make sure that whatever the repair material is used is also very well cured. Like we may have discussed in the case of concrete uh, construction, curing is very very important. It is not only the use of good quality materials like fly ash or slag or silica fume or anything for that matter. But at the same time you have to provide enough moisture, you have to provide enough water for the hydration reaction to occur so that you will really be able to use the full potential of the uh, uh, material which is used. In this case here full potential of the repair material. So what I just discussed is given here in as in the form of a flow chart uh, you can just go through it uh, in more detail uh, later. Now anatomy of surface repair. So how this is happening this is a, gra a, a nice sketch which shows what happens. So first in case of a uh, concrete reinforced concrete structures first you will observe some cracks uh, happening 
you can see here these are the rebars 1, 2, 3. So, these are all the rebars and uh, initially there is if there is a slight corrosion happening then there, there will be some cracks and then this crack will further uh, grow or the corrosion will further, further corrosion will happen which will lead to delamination of the concrete which eventually spalls the concrete and then uh, once it is spalled then you have to really uh, do a major repair uh, and basically remove the loose concrete and then cut uh, you know uh, you know cut the concrete as you see here in this section here uh, cut the or remove the cover concrete and clean the reinforcement surface and then apply the new uh, repair material. Now, let us look at uh, the type of stresses which act on a structural element or here I am showing an example of a bridge uh, element with uh, you can see beam column and a sla uh, slab on grade setup where you can see if you are talking about thermal loading you know you can see here even uh, shear will happen between the slabs and thermal loading will lead to uh, you know expansion and shrinkage and then live loads from the vehicles I am sorry live loads from the vehicles and then moving load you can lead to abrasion and removal of uh, concrete surface. So, and here if there is a difference in the moisture conditions or the temperature conditions then you can see a lot of uh, sh uh, shrinkage happening if uh, the grey portions here are different material or a repair material as compared to the uh, you know uh, white uh, region. So, you can see that some some things happen and a different type of repair might be required and then when you talk about repairing like for example, here in this case in this in this case here if I am actually replacing at the uh, some concrete at the bottom of a bridge deck what are the things which I should worry about I must ensure that this uh, red arrows indicated uh, for the shrink uh, bond between the or the shear stress between the existing and the substrate. So, you have to really think about how compatible that material is whether that new repair material is going to shrink uh, as compared to uh, the existing or the substrate. So, different uh, strain compatibility you have to really look at may many factors before just placing the uh, new repair material. So, it is not only strength sometimes because most often we see people talking about just strength and then uh, you know put micro concrete and say that this is repair, but you have to really think about many factors ensure that the bond between the existing and the uh, existing substrate and the repair material is also very good. So, that you do not have much problems uh, later on and will not end up in doing a repair of repair later. Okay. Uh, Let us look at the type of stresses between the old and new materials or concrete. So, as you can see the picture you know sketch here where you are looking at basically the shear bond and we also will look at tensile bond and flexural bond. Let us first talk about the shear bond and in case of a composite overlay on uh, let us say on a bridge deck you will have an additional layer and then when you select this additional layer which is indicated by this uh, white region here in this first one this this white region is an overlay and so the bond between the overlay and the substrate is very very important otherwise uh, you will see probably delamination not because of corrosion but because in some cases uh, even water can get in and then it will create significant debondment between the uh, debonding of the overlay and I have seen it in many places and also the, uh, the fle flexural action or the bending the uh, both the overlay and the substrate concrete or the deck itself both these systems should bend together they sh it should not bend like a laminated system. So, both should act together. So, for that to happen uh, the bond between these two are very very uh, important. Okay. So, and in another case if you have a, a settlement let us say this brown color in, in this picture this here the brown color indicates the soil below and if you have uh, a cavity or something below one of the slab then again you will have a shear uh, force acting at this intersection or the join between the two elements. 
So, element number 1 and element number 2. So, you do not want uh, such things also or and if you are talking about the uh, temperature variation and uh, if the shrinkage uh, you know coefficient or the uh, thermal coefficient if the coefficient of thermal expansion for this material is different than for that for this material then also you will have some uh, expansion or contraction happening or differential uh, expansion or contraction happening which will again lead to uh, shear uh, stresses between the uh, top and bottom layer in this particular system. So, we have to really think about the shear bond. Uh, and how well these two systems are you know two elements which are in contact are bonded. So, that is very very important. Similarly, tensile bond is also very important. We also have to uh, look at the tensile bond uh, as you see in this case here you can see if uh, there is an overlay and then if uh, let us say there is some traction or you know some kind of uh, lifting force is acting. Uh, traction is horizontal, but you know eventually uh, let us say let us not talk about traction, but let us say if there is a lifting force uh, acting on the overlay, then the bond again the bond uh, here that is the tensile bond uh, is very very important to consider not the shear bond in that case, but the tensile bond in that case. Now, flexural action again if you have an uneven support as you see in the picture here. If you have an uneven support again the system will try to uh, bend and then how well the joint will act react uh, or you know joint will function during that bending action. So, right now here they should uh, be intact the joint should be intact uh, to take care of even when the uh, flexural forces uh, are acting. So, now let us look at uh, the type of stresses within the new material that means here you can see that the sketches are having only the dark shaded or the gray shaded uh, elements like in this case we had both dark and white uh, or gray and white uh, that was mainly to indicate old and new materials that is basically between two materials. Here what we are talking is what happen what type of stresses could exist within the repair material itself. So, here also we will have internal stresses developed may be because of uh, some chemical action happening inside or may be because of shrinkage uh, like you know due to the temperature variation due to the moisture conditions and also you might have concentrated strain or in other words uh, you know near the crack locations that is and may be we may have all these combinations also uh, happen happening in the uh, repair material. So, compressive, shear, tensile and flexural all these have to be considered uh, and these kind of stresses might exist uh, in within the repair material. So, let us look at uh, primary uh, repair performance requirements or performance requirements uh, or cr crucial performance requirements for a column slab uh, joint. So, the main thing is the surface repair if it is deep enough uh, the let us say imagine this uh, gray shaded region in this have actually uh, you know got damaged and then you have to repair that region. The main uh, because it is near the surface near the support uh, you already have you have to ensure that the new material which is provided will also be helpful in handling the shear loads at that location. So, you have to think like when you talk about a repair material what the existing system uh, was actually un, uh, supposed to undertake uh, care of and what type of loads and the new material should also be able to take that type of load or you can think about what led to the failure and what is the failure and if I put a new material what is the type of load which will be uh, acting on that new material. So, in this case there will be significant shear load or shear uh, you know. Uh, so, the material the new material has to uh, uh, handle that uh, shear uh, it should have good shear strength also. Now, you have in this case uh, the reinforcement which is inside. So, if you have reinforcement here that also should be able to transfer the load from this portion to this portion. So, the repair material has to uh, protect the steel reinforcement 
and at the stay same time be able to transfer the load from one point to the other point through the uh, you know repair repaired region. Now, protection also is very very important. In other words, why I put this protection is we should not have a very loose quality or a very poor quality material which will not give sufficient protection from corrosion especially for the uh, rebar. Now, uh, let us look at a beam column uh, joint again another example is a typical corbel support you can see here. Okay. Now, here also it must transfer the structural loads which are coming from the beam to the column. So, the load transfer is from here it has to be transferred to the uh, column. So, we have to see what type of stress is acting and at which point in the uh, corbel system and if you are in a repair project you have to see how do we repair with minimal effort that is also very important because you may have many solutions, but the solution is feasible or not is also something important to uh, look at. So, as you see here in the picture on the bottom right you can see how the cracks are. So, ideally speaking I can say I have to put something like this. A reinforcement or a tie something like that to take care of to provide minimal to provide a, you know a, a, to close the crack and then to take care of uh, those loads in the direction perpendicular to the crack. But when you talk about why, you know constructability that may not be a good way to do. So, it might be easy for uh, anybody to actually provide something which is horizontal uh, it is easy to work in that way as you see in the picture at the bottom. In this particular case, there are two, uh, you know, post tension ties are provided. You can see one here, and then one at this level, and both are horizontal because that is easy to work with and install. So we have to really see what is the feasibility of the repair. It's not just providing a solution, and that's where it becomes very important for the person who designs. They should also think about how the design can be implemented or you know in practice. Now, this is a case study on this kind of repair uh, where you can see whatever I just discussed you can see here this is a support coming and this is a tie provided. So, uh, you know again in this particular case if the corbel is very large if the width you know the depth of this 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 is very large then maybe this through and through or the tie going from one side to the one end to the of the corbel or from this end to this end it might be very difficult to do. So, in or you can in if it is very deep then you can even think of how to provide an anchor without really drilling a hole through the corbel in a full depth hole maybe you can provide something up to here and then you have some kind of uh, anchoring system there and still it will give you uh, maybe not here, but you know depending on where not here maybe until here depending on until where you can reach and uh, particular loading conditions and the crack locations etcetera. And also in some cases you may not have access to the back side of the uh, corbel. So, in such cases also you may have to uh, see uh, whether some kind of anchoring uh, inside or embedded anchor system can be uh, used. So, anyway point is that you have to look at the site conditions, what are the constraints at the site and then come up with a design methodology uh, for repair. Now, in this particular case there was a demand for increase in the load carry capacity by uh, 5 times or 500 percent which is I would say 5 times. And, uh, yeah, stressing. Yeah, one important thing to note here: stressing short strand is very challenging, because when you talk about a very short strand, if you have a slip of like let's say just a millimeter or two or something, then that might significantly reduce the residual stress on the strand. So you have to really uh, think about if it is a long strand, then it's easy for anyone to stress even if there is a, a, some uh, you know a seating capacity seating loss or something like that it might not significantly affect. But in case of a short uh, a tie there you have to really think about what uh, the initial slippage or seating loss etcetera are not significantly high. Uh, so, that still sufficient stress is or pre stress is uh, remaining in the system. 
Here I just wanted to show you an example where uh, a damage has happened because of uh, you know at the time of erection you know an impact load can happen and then uh, also improper edge design. So, you can see the damage at the edge very significant exposing the reinforcement and which will also uh, not look uh, good, but at the same time it will also lead to other problems. Uh, so, erection is also something very important uh, to look at. The element should be uh, erect uh, during the erection we should not allow any impact load uh, to uh, happen. Okay. Now, another thing is repair performance uh, and uh, what are the requirements uh, when you talk about surface repair, they must protect the embedded reinforcement that is one thing and then it should look good or aesthetic aesthetically pleasing and the repair material should be adhered well to the substrate. Now, this one uh, you know on the right side the sketch is a very typical uh, damage which we often see in wherever we go staircases you or in a railings you can see that to provide maximum space available on this surface what uh, the, there is a tendency to move the railing to the edge you know as much as possible to the left end in this case and which provides very limited space limited material on the outside of the rail. So, in some cases this becomes so thin that it does not really uh, you know it is very difficult to prevent the cracking as you see on the picture on the bottom uh, you can see that if a person is leaning like this there is a significant stress acting uh, on the uh, at the bottom or the concrete right next to the uh, bottom of the rail and you can see there is here there is a cracking you can see here there is this region is cracked. So, to prevent this type of cracks what we have to have is significant material on the outside of the railing as you see here you can see or the entire railing should be uh, well addressed with the uh, that particular repair region should be well addressed and it should be able to take the structural loads coming from the uh, railing system. So, if you know that this much load is coming maybe you can actually use a higher strength material and then still uh, if without really increasing the size of the element you can still get the stress uh, you know get the strength which is required. Okay. Now, uh, when you talk about load transfer through a surface repair on a column. Okay. So, you can see an example here at the bottom right where a column was you know experiencing significant corrosion and the entire cover concrete is removed at this particular stage and you they are going for uh, replacing uh, with a new material. And so, something like that uh, if the sketch shown is something very similar where uh, in this particular in this slide I am going to show uh, you know if the stress level in the remaining concrete that means if the amount of removal of the concrete is very less uh, or very uh, you know near the surface only the concrete is removed then the surface repair may not require to carry the structural loads because all the stress part these these were the vertical lines which you see here all these uh, li vertical lines they are actually the stress path and then what you see is even if the repair material which is the gray shaded region here even if it is not taking any load still there may not be significant increase in the uh, stress level in the remaining portion or in the substrate concrete. Okay. But uh, if the amount of concrete repair material is more then like in this case you can see here then there is a deeper or more amount of repair material uh, uh, is there. In other words the, uh, uh, the uh, there is a significant damage and more cover concrete is removed and then you are replacing that with uh, repair material. This is probably the case as you see in this picture here you can see that significant entire concrete cover is removed in this particular column and then you are providing a whole new cover concrete. And in such case if the cover concrete uh, is not taking uh, the load then the st stress 
taken by this concrete which is marked by the blue ellipse at the center that might be significantly high. So, it becomes very important for the repair material to be able to take the load. So, the load should go through the repair material. In other words, a load transfer should happen through the repair material. If the thickness of removal is very less, then it is not always necessary. If it is happening, it is very good, no issues with that. But even if it is not happening, it is still okay. But when you go for a deeper repair, then definitely that repair material should take uh, the load and should be able to transfer the load. And when I say transfer the load, this now point number 4 is very important. They must be able to carry the structural uh, load. Now, uh, how to ensure that this proper load transfer is happening? Because most of the time this repair material might, uh, because repair material is a new material and the column which is already there, it is an old uh, material which might have undergone all the shrinkage. Uh, you know all uh, all sorts of uh, such mechanisms and uh, it might have the further deformations might be less in that material but in the case of repair material it is still new material so it might have uh, might experience a shrinkage unless you ensure that the repair material is uh, you know uh, there are adequate measures taken and ensuring that the shrinkage is very very low in such materials so, anyway, let us say as a theory, if, if it is going to experience some shrinkage, this shrinkage will develop some shear stress between the uh, substrate and the repair material and uh, that will lead to a reduction in the uh, reduction in the, um, in the height of the uh, repair material and it might also happen that if there is a let us say coefficient of thermal expansion of the repair material is different from that of the substrate concrete and maybe if there is some expansion happening let us say if there is a lot of moisture getting into this column and then the repair material expands then you will have again uh, shear uh, stresses uh, because of the expansion. So, both expansion and contraction you have to uh, consider. Uh, so, basically the dimensional variations can happen and now how do we ensure that even if there is a dimensional variation there is still a stress uh, you know uh, stress uh, transfer or load transfer we can provide a rebar as is shown here we can provide a rebar which goes through the repair material and uh, transfer the load to the uh, substrate okay so, this is also something very, very important especially when you are talking about uh, structures which has significant loading uh, etcetera. So, the selection of material becomes very crucial here, the selection of repair material. You have to use a material with minimal volume change that means either due to shrinkage or due to creep and because you know uh, etcetera and then essentially you have to have good uh, strain compatibility uh, also. Now, this is an example uh, showing more details of this particular uh, repair work. You can see here most of the columns probably the you know the there were a lot of capillary pores in this uh, concrete columns and you that absorbed moisture uh, from the uh, ground during the rainy season and then you can see very clearly about 1 meter height uh, 1 1 and a half about 1 meter height from the ground you can see that. Uh, columns are all damaged mainly because of the uh, capillary suction of the moisture from ground and maintaining it wet and then that leads to uh, significant corrosion because why I am saying that this portion of the concrete is intact it does not have any problem that is. So, definitely moisture is the problem here. So, if you want to repair this structure you provide a new concrete and make sure that that new concrete is actually. Uh, you know having good resistance against uh, capillary suction also or water softivity of the concrete uh, sh can be checked before uh, using it. Now, it is another example on column repair uh, case study got this from the internet, but I found it is very uh, interesting and good uh, case study to discuss. You can see the picture here which is after repair how it uh, looks at the top. Uh, and also sorry uh, and uh, 
sorry not after repair this is before repair itself you can see the top of the column is good but at the bottom of the column this is how the situation was you can see significant uh, corrosion and uh, which led to delamination you can see here and this in particular case of this this was a fact uh, factory where a chemical plant where uh, there was significant variations in the temperature and at the same time the ambient uh, environment had significant amount of chlorides. So, chloride ingress was high especially uh, where the temperature was more and which was uh, you know at the bottom there was some uh, you know chemical uh, or sorry the equipment which were pumping high heat. So, you had high temperature uh, and at the same time chloride ingress uh, chloride environment which led to ingress of chlorides especially at the bottom of the column and then eventually steel corrosion and then how do we repair the first thing is to uh, put uh, shoring so that the entire load which the uh, basically the uh, the column is de-stressed or there is no stress or load acting on the column let me just go back to this slide here also you can see that the load acting on the column is completely released you can see shoring on this uh, over here and these are the supports provided the steel uh, props which you can see. So, this uh, you know releasing the load from the columns are very is very important when we talk about uh, repair. So, here also you can see uh, there is uh, this uh, shoring to uh, release the load from the column and then uh, column is prepared for high strength concrete pour. What I mean by prepared for is surface preparation. You have to remove all the loose materials and uh, uh, clean the reinforcement, uh, remove the uh, uh, spalled concrete and then provide uh, you know nice form work and also in this particular case they change the shape from rectangular to a circular shape. Um, and uh, the concrete in this case SCC was poured and then also a nice uh, because it is a chemical plant. So, always you will still have the aggressive environment which was existing earlier. So, we have to consider that the environment is not going to change. So, the only thing which we can change is the quality of the concrete cover. So, um, you know and again thermal cyclic stresses. So, that uh, particular concrete which was used. Uh, uh, was selected with uh, you know very low coefficient of thermal expansion and at the same time covered with uh, metallic uh, casing. In this case you can see steel uh, stainless steel uh, pipe is provided. So, it looks very good right now. So, another example uh, for a beam repair you can see how the stress flow ha can happen first. If the repair material which is the grey grey thing here, if the repair material either shrinks or expands in this example I am showing the shrinking. So, what will happen is it will get disconnected from the uh, it will get disconnected from the uh, you can see here this is a shrinkage happening. So, if uh, this portion here will it will get disconnected and there will not be direct uh, load transfer through the repair material when it is trying to flex or bend. So, what will happen uh, you know the stress will be more on the substrate or the remaining uh, concrete uh, will have more compressive stress or in other words this region will experience more compression. Uh, because the repair material is not taking any load. So, how do we prevent this from happening? First thing is you have to provide a shoring, lift the beam or girder upward and get the uh, you know horizontal shape or uh, you know all the deflection have to be removed and uh, means uh, made it to 0 and then you place the um, repair material. So, that when it uh, tries to bend again that repair material will also uh, come into action and you can see very clearly on the bottom picture these arrows are provided inside the repair material that means the load is transferred through the repair material also. So, again the picture on the right side shows an example where something similar was uh, you know the shoring is done. 
again in this picture uh, we are talking about repair at the bottom surface not on the uh, top surface. So, all this have to be I mean I could not get a, a good picture for the top, but this is something which uh, we have to remember. Shoring is important then you have to see what type of material and whether where it is applied and then um, release all the load acting on the member apply the new material and then ensure that that new material is in contact with the uh, substrate. So, that when the load is applied it is taken by both the uh, new material and the uh, substrate concrete. Okay. Now, how to ensure the load transfer through surface uh, repair underneath a beam, beam not at the top. The picture which I showed in the previous slide this is I should have put this in the uh, next slide, but uh, it is ok. Uh, you know what I am talking. Now, here you can see a rebar is also provided because here when we talk at the bottom what is the type of load? It is a tensile load which is coming when there is a deflection in this beam it is the tensile load which is coming. So, that uh, repair material should be able to take uh, provide adequate protection for the rebar because most often the, the rebar has to take care of the tension right. So, you provide a rebar and ensure that the rebar is actually well protected. So, that it can uh, last long and then uh, uh, provide that adequate or you know additional uh, tensile uh, strength required. Now, uh, this is another example you can see a very uh, you know uh, highway with uh, significant volume of traffic but uh, the bearings were worn out and this is something which happens in uh, many bridges uh, the uh, neoprene pads or shoes you know those uh, joint elements uh, they actually really uh, uh, degrade very fast because sometimes they do not get sufficient importance at the time of construction and also it gets overloaded or if they are the quality of those materials especially for the fatigue type of loading or repeated loading if they are not well rated then you will see that those materials will fail where the girders are still probably sometimes uh, ok. So, a uh, point I am trying to make here is every element in a structure is very important. It is not that only the big uh, you know large girders or columns are important even the connections are also equally important for good performance of the structure. Because if connections do not perform well that will induce additional loads on to the structural elements and that joints might fail and then it you know you will see significant deflections and uh, rider comfort will not be good and you will also see impact loads acting. So, these are all something uh, you know uh, more serious attention need to be given even for these uh, small small elements. Okay. Uh, here also you can see uh, shoring is done I can see here and then the load from this duct uh, uh, the girders it directly transferred to the ground. So, that there is no load acting on the uh, on the column uh, column and bend cap here. Okay. So, repair is actually happening on this and the bend cap um, on, on either side. Now, you can see a little bit closer image here this is this is the portion where uh, repair is happening and there is a good support uh, the load is directly transferred from the, uh, the steel girder on the top to the ground and you have a concrete bend cap here a concrete bend and a concrete column. You can see here this is again the concrete column which is sorry concrete uh, uh, girder beam which is uh, uh, repaired and you have columns also concrete columns. And here uh, the load from the steel girders here is directly transferred through this through these uh, steel columns and into the ground. Now, analysis of the problem first thing we need to look at uh, you know what are the visual inspection you know when you go for inspection what all things we need to look for and then try to assess the primary and secondary effects which is probably visible when you are at the site. You can see what are things are visible no no deep thinking at that time, but first you see what is visible to you. One thing which would be visible is that steel reinforcement is corroding 
and other things because of the reinforcement corrosion you may also have cracking, delamination, spalling etc. Now what to do? You may have to go for a solution which could be a surface repair and if you say these are the uh, primary and secondary effects which are manifestations of the problem and you can actually see them. Now why they happen that is the cause when you look at again you can split the cause into primary and secondary. If you are talking about chloride from the salt or whatever the external environment, marines environment or you know uh, chloride rich ground water, whatever it is there is presence of chlorides and what that will do in case of more presence of moisture it will lead to corrosion, cracking and additional uh, if the uh, rebar cover, cover depth is very limited or if the quality of the concrete is very bad then this chloride will ingress. If you do not have moisture and if you do not have cracking, if you do not have cracks, if you do not have, uh, uh, if you have sufficient cover and if the concrete permeability is very low then even though there are chlorides outside the concrete they may not be able to enter it so easily. So, uh, it is a combination of both primary and secondary causes must be looked at and identified then accordingly five figure out what is the repair strategy and then the preventive maintenance because it is not just repairing after repair you have to ensure that the repair is not going to experience the same problem. So, that is why here there are two things one is repair solution and then also a preventive maintenance for the repair and all these have to be addressed in the future time. So, what we see again this corrosion or you know the structure have got damaged because of something which was not done earlier. So, learning from the lesson we should repair and make sure that such repair, you know repairs are not needed later on. Okay. So, that is why preventive maintenance strategy is very very uh, important <coughs> to uh, know. Now, after all this you know if you want if you are talking about uh, what are the strategies which we should adopt because there are in the next lecture we will talk about different type of repair uh, you know strategies. Here I am showing 5 pictures on the uh, 5 sketches on the right side where you will notice that the black or the grey portion is the uh, repair material you have a reinforcement going through and you will see on the first one here you will see that there is a green coating also which is the coating which we provided to the reinforcement and <coughs> so in the system 1 or strategy 1 you are seeing one redundancy that means two repair systems are there one is the repair material itself which is the grey shaded region and the second which is the redundant system is the uh, you know the coating itself. So, both these will help in preventing corrosion of the reinforcement. So, why we are calling redundant? Let us say the repair material itself uh, even though we recommended a good material, but for some reason that did not function very well and then chlorides penetrated through and reached the rebar. Now, for giving the protection for the steel you the, there is an additional coating available which will if it is in good shape, if it is intact uh, or crack free, damage free coating then that will protect which is the idea of a good quality epoxy coated uh, fusion bonded epoxy coated rebar, but sometimes that they do not work because of cracks and etcetera on the rebar uh, or damage on the rebar or even UV exposure of the rebar. So, these kind of things we have to ensure point is there are two systems working there to protect the steel from corrosion. In this strategy 2 where you have uh, you know again one redundancy now the two systems here are the repair material which is the grey shaded region which is this and also you have a uh, surface coating provided on uh, coating provided on the surface of the concrete not the surface of the steel reinforcement. So, first protection here comes from the surface coating and if that fails then you have a good quality uh, repair material which will provide additional uh, protection uh, for uh, from, from, from entering for additional protection uh, to prevent the entry of deleterious elements from the external environment 
and uh, which will uh, eventually lead to corrosion. So, multiple strategies can be ab adopted and uh, you know and of course, we cannot provide all these uh, strategies for all the repairs available. Of course, we have to think about the uh, money available finance and at the same time, we also have to think about are is it really required what is the how important the structure is or how easy it is to is it to, you know let us say uh, you are uh, suggesting all the three uh, you know repair system like as you see here in the strategy 5, but it is not really an important structure and it is probably very easy to go back and repair after some 10 years or something. Then in such case you may not want to go for all the uh, you know redundancies, but uh, if you are talking about a very important structure, let us say a bridge which is in the downtown of a city or you know in the very important intersection uh, or a flyover where it is not easy all the time uh, to go and repair, to get permissions to repair and also a uh, lot of heavy traffic, a uh, lot of traffic. So, you know deviating the traffic is uh, not that easy in such cases you want to have uninterrupted traffic system right. So, in such cases you may want to go for uh, multiple uh, systems which will function if one fails the other will take care of uh, you know uh, the structure and then it will help in uh, enhancing the uh, life of the uh, repair itself. So, these are multiple strategies uh, different types of solutions or strategies are available depending on the money available and depending on the importance of the structure uh, and you know we have to decide which strategies uh, to be adopted. So, to summarize uh, when you talk about strategies and repair materials the first thing is you have to look at the root cause of the problem what led to the problem in the beginning and then prevent the same in future that is also very important. So, that uh, if I, one example I would say here is let us say the corrosion happened because of a broken drain pipe. The first thing to do is before even repairing the structure first you have to go and install a new drain pipe. So, that moisture attack is not there. So, which we often see in many cases you know you do not really address the root cause, but keep on repairing the structure. So, from now on I request you to look at root cause of any problem when you see and then address the root cause first and we talked about different type of repair where you know sometimes it could be structural reasons and sometimes uh, you know also just cosmetic and sometimes we have to consider both structural and cosmetic. And then we looked at type of stress acting on uh, the repair materials uh, sometimes the stress is because of the uh, reactions happening within the material and sometimes it must be it might be because of uh, two uh, elements or between the two element between the repair and the substrate or between two elements. So, you have to see what are the type of stresses acting and what are uh, means whether you have to think about the shear bond, tensile bond, flexural bond etcetera or you know sometimes even compressive stresses. So, these stresses will lead to some uh, you know interaction between the two materials which might ask you which might uh, need. Uh, you know but uh, which might affect the bond. So, bond strength between the material systems is also very very important and uh, behavior we looked at also the performance requirements of a repair material uh, like this uh, bond strength etcetera that is important and also we talked about I do not have that bullet here, but we talked about uh, you know when you repair a column or a beam first thing to do is release the existing load and then go for uh, repair. So, that the repair material will also take part in taking this uh, loads uh, or the help in uh, will take the uh, sorry the repair material will also help in transferring the load from the substrate uh, to the uh, through the repair material to uh, the other element other portions of the concrete. So, load transfer is very very important the repair materials are not there just for cosmetic purpose, but they are also supposed to take part uh, in uh, the uh, they are also supposed to take part in carrying the uh, structural loads. Now, lastly we discussed about different strategies there are multiple strategies available. But uh, you have to look at the economics 
and also importance of the structure and importance of the repair uh, and then decide uh, whether to go for redundant or uh, you know protection systems uh, or not. I think uh, with that we will stop and these are the references uh, used for making this uh, uh, presentation or lecture. Thank you.